All right, good morning, everyone, or I guess for folks on the East Coast, good afternoon. Uh, appreciate all of you being here with us. I'm excited to, to moderate this session. I'm Jim Carr, president of the NAIA, and uh, we're fortunate to have, uh, as part of this panel discussion today, two of the leading experts in sports medicine uh, around the country with us today. Uh, they have over four decades of experience working with athletes and programs and are now, um, I'm sure they feel like on a full-time basis, working with associations and conferences to try to help us figure out how to manage all things, all things COVID. And personally, I want to thank them for the, the assistance and the good counsel they're giving to help the NAI as we navigate uh, through these challenging times. We have and uh, will continue to lean on them as we, as we strive to keep all of our student athletes safe and help our member institutions uh, continue to move forward with, with athletics. I want to thank all of you who submitted some questions to us today. I'll, I'll ask um, our panelists as many of these as we can get through in about 45 minutes or so. Um, and then for the last 15 minutes, we'll take, we'll take questions from the audience. So you can see on your screen there how you would go about doing that if you have a question, um, either now or as we move along through the session. Uh, just put that in the chat and if you will, send it to me, send it to Jim Carr so that it doesn't go to, to everyone. Um, and then we'll get again, get to dump as many of those as we can in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, so I'd like to start by a quick introduction of our uh, two experts that are there in this session. Uh, first, Dr. Jim Borchers. A lot of you are probably familiar with Jim through our uh, terrific partnership with USCA. Jim is the founder of, of USCA and um, is, is becoming or already is uh, one of the leading experts in trying to help uh, folks get back to return to play and then uh, again, navigate through all things COVID. Um, as, as president and co-founder of USCH, he has vast experience with healthcare models at all levels. Um, most of his professional involvement lies in sports medicine and leadership, serving in a number of important clinical and leadership positions. Uh, Dr. Borchers applies his athletic healthcare knowledge as both an author and a public speaker, presenting to athletic organizations on a national scale. And then joining uh, Jim, is Chad Asplund. Uh, Chad also has a vast array of experience in sports medicine and has provided healthcare to athletes at all levels, from professional all the way down to recreational. Uh, he practices sports medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Um, he's previously served as president of the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine and is currently the team physician for both USA Basketball and US Ski and Snowboard, among the many other things that he does as well. So. Um, with that introduction, I'll just jump right into the, the questions. And I think, uh, Jim, we'll start or direct the first question at you. Um, this comes from, again, from one of our, uh, someone in our membership. And the question is, uh, as our institution is beginning to evaluate and establish a plan for second semester, what guidelines or recommendations can you give us as far as institutional testing? Do you recommend mass institutional testing upon arrival back to campus or maybe smaller surveillance testing throughout the year? Um, and, and or testing of those who are symptomatic. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jim, and thanks for having us today. Uh, it's great to join you and your institutions um, and appreciate that. You know, the, the question is really a difficult one uh, because um, the first thing that we need to think about when institutions talk about coming back for their second semester is where the pandemic is at that time in their, in their locale. And as we've seen, um, obviously, it changes very quickly from week to week uh, on you know, in, in various locations, although I think it's safe to say that throughout most of the United States right now, we're seeing this pandemic uh, going in the wrong direction. But given the fact that in, people will be returning to institutions uh, from usually many different regions and different places, some sort of entrance testing coming back to get an idea about um, what the, you know, um, prevalence of COVID is that's coming on the campus is reasonable. But even if testing can't be done, strategies can be used as you bring people back. And it may be that there needs to be an initial quarantine period. And some institutions have talked about an initial quarantine period when people return to campus with either um, virtual learning uh, for some period of time or um, requiring uh, people to really maintain their residence with a stay at home recommendation for a period of time. And then I think the question about surveillance testing is, uh, is really interesting because 
um, we are getting much better data than what we had even three months ago that we are not seeing the spread of COVID within the academic environment uh, itself. So within the classroom, the labs uh, and the places on campus. Where we are seeing it is in residential settings and in social settings. And uh, in fact, uh, even in small setting, small group settings like that. Um, so there may be, if there are resources, reason I think to think about um, surveillance model uh, type testing with a small, you know, with a certain percentage of individuals and certainly individuals that are symptomatic. But I think all that has to be worked into a global plan of how you're going to address, you know, your return to, you know, the return to the institution uh, when you come back and, and looking at the environment uh, that the institution exists in at that time. Okay. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. Um, Chad, the next question will, will send towards you and it, it's really around um, how to deal with a team member that's tested tested positive uh, say in the past week uh, questions around should that team be allowed to travel how should the team should the team still be allowed to practice or how to deal with with one person on a team uh, testing positive so uh, when you have uh, an individual test positive um, you know certainly that individual needs to isolate for 10 days and then the contact tracing process needs to needs to happen. And, and depending on, on where you are and what that looks like at your institution, you know, trying to figure out how many folks can be considered close contacts with that individual going back 48 hours from, you know, the, the time that that person became positive. Then I would think that once you find your contact, your close exposures, those people would then need to be quarantined. And so if you have your positive athletes isolated, your close exposure is quarantined, and then whoever remains, um, you know, for the, the basis of your team should be okay to remain to practice and to play. It just depends on what the number of positives and the number of people that are uh, found to be contact, close contacts are, what that looks like as far as a percentage of your overall team. You know, can you have a safe practice? Can you, are you missing an entire position group? Things like that. Um, but I do think you have to let the isolation and the contact tracing play out in the quarantine. And if you have athletes that are left over that don't fit into those categories, so they've been you know, negative or not close contacts, they should be able to practice and play um, and traveling. Certainly with travel, you want to continue to make sure that you're distancing uh, when you can you're wearing masks, you're following the usual stuff, mask wearing, social distance, hand washing, um, you know, other things that we would otherwise recommend for infection control. Okay, thanks, Chad. And maybe just a little bit of a, a follow-up on the, you know, the concept of close contact. I know I've seen it change a little bit over time, or I've just seen it described a little bit differently. I think that maybe the most common one I've seen is either 10 or 15 minutes in close contact unmasked. Is that is that kind of still the typical definition or standard or what are you, what are you guys seeing? Uh, I'll start and then uh, Jim, Jim can add. Um, but typically the definition is, you know, within six feet for 15 minutes and that's cumulative within a 24 to 48 hour period, depending on who you're, who you're listening to. So it isn't just a one-time shot and okay, now it's later in the day. I can start my, my uh, 15 minutes again. It's a cumulative exposure to 15 minutes within six feet. Realistically, the studies would support that if you're masked, the amount of transmission that you could give at six feet should be less. However, in my experience, the way that public health professionals have been applying this, it's the same whether you're masked or unmasked. So within six feet, 15 minutes of exposure, uh, cumulative within a 24 to 48 hour period. Jim, any, any, any other thoughts? No, Chad, I think, you, I think you're right. I think the other thing to consider is uh, there's some recommendations to Jim around, uh, you know, direct contact, and it's been defined loosely as, you know, um, being as close as to where you're hugging someone and having that kind of close contact. That being said, there is data that's emerging and certainly that we're looking at uh, as what defines a close contact in sport itself. Um, and there's some good data coming out uh, that uh, suggests that the actual transmission in outdoor sports where there's close contact is not significant and uh, maybe much less than what we thought as we define sports as high-risk transmission. 
And so in uh, just recently from England, a paper in rugby where actually individuals that were participating actually were infectious and we did not see any um, transmission to the individuals that they were with. Um, there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence in uh, soccer and in football um, with transmission not occurring uh, in the actual event itself. I think what Chad mentioned is exactly right. The most risky behavior for these things are what happens around the events, so either around travel or meals or um, you know the the things that happen around the events and. Um, and so I think from that standpoint, if you're paying attention in those events and masking appropriately um, and physically distancing, uh, paying attention to those things, I think we're going to see very little transmission actually within sport activity itself. Um, uh, I think uh, I think the, we know so much more about that now than we did three months ago that it's uh, uh, providing us uh, with some really good uh, thoughts on uh, how to move this forward. All right, thanks, Jim. And that, that's kind of a good segue into the, the next question, which is specific to wrestling. Um, and the question is around, you know, with again, what we know about COVID and some of the things you just described uh, about the transmission. Um, and, and I guess part of the question, too, is recognizing the fact that a wrestling match is, is under 15 minutes in duration. Um, do we think we can, can safely wrestle both regular season and postseason in this year? Well, I think wrestling poses some unique challenges, but I do think that it can be done appropriately. I think you have to pay attention to what's going on around the wrestling events themselves, uh, making certain that training partners stay consistent so there's not a lot of uh, transmission, uh, making certain that weight classes, uh, um, you know, stay you know, consistent and physically distanced so that we don't see transmission uh, amongst those folks. Um, again, making certain um, that we're following the other regulations. Um, and, you know, they're probably in a, you know, again, in a high risk transmission sport like that. If you are able to test, if you have resources, these are the sports we're testing may be helpful to prevent, you know, larger pop-up clusters or outbreaks. There are states that are wrestling without testing uh, at the high school and at the elite uh, amateur level. Um, and again, I think there's going to be some risk there, obviously, by the nature of the sport itself. Um, but it has been managed to this point. I think we just have to be aware of the environment and what we just talked about. But I think taking those mitigating factors and, and having been involved with the uh, uh, USOC regional wrestling uh, uh, this fall and uh, with uh, other wrestling groups, we have seen it done successfully. Um, and, uh, and I think you can move forward with it. It poses more challenges than, you know, sports where we're not having as much contact, but it can be, it can be accomplished. Okay. Thanks. Um, Chad, and if you want to add anything to that, but a, a different question um, coming your way. Um, as I understand it, many of our athletics trainers are using uh, return to activity recommendations made by the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And part of that includes a gradual return for an athlete so that you can track increased symptoms. So the question is around if, if it's an asymptomatic person who's tested positive, would this, this protocol still work? Or how would you, how would you monitor someone who is asymptomatic as they're, as they're coming back in? Thanks. That's a, a great question. Um, so the British Journal uh, Return to Play progression is based on a COVID positive symptomatic patient. And so it is a very well done, gradual return to play protocol that could be followed for anybody. With your asymptomatic positive people, you know, we have been allowing them to do light physical activity well in isolation. Um, and so they may not need as lengthy of a return to play process, but it's still important when someone does return, whether it's from asymptomatic or symptomatic COVID, that they do have a gradual return to play. Those that are completely asymptomatic probably can do a shorter return to play process than what is laid out in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. However, it is important to do to gradually increase the, the duration and the intensity, because what we really are looking for is with exercise, do these asymptomatic patients develop symptoms? And then that those may be some that need further evaluation, or they may need to go back into that symptomatic pathway if they develop symptoms in this return to play progression. So all patients returning back from 
our athletes returning back from COVID positive status do need a graduated return to play. The one in the British Journal is very well done, and it's it's about 17 days long, but works very well for those with symptoms. Those that are asymptomatic should go through a, a similar process, but it could be shorter. Yeah, and Chad, I, I would just add to that. I, I think um, that we have found uh, in looking, obviously, at a number of patients that consider themselves asymptomatic, it's really important that they meet with their healthcare provider to understand what asymptomatic means. Unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, most 18 to 25 year olds have to be really significantly symptomatic for them to consider themselves sick. And although we know things like loss of taste and smell are not uh, really prognostic of significant symptoms, as we've actually questioned athletes that have had struggles getting back to sport, they have had would we would now consider to be mild or moderate symptoms, but they themselves did not consider themselves symptomatic and said that normally they would have continued to just function and do things as they normally would have had they not known they were COVID positive. So um, we have seen some cases where um, it's difficult for those athletes to get back to uh, sport. And I would just encourage, um, you know, everyone, and I know athletic trainers are excellent at this and really, really drilling down into what the course of the illness was for their, uh, for their athlete and then making, you know, good decisions moving forward. And that's not to say, as Chad mentioned, I think there's a number of athletes that in seven to 10 days, if they've had mild or no symptoms can probably get back to sport. Uh, but as he mentioned, for those that have been symptomatic, we're finding it can take longer. Okay. And then Jim, that was one of the questions that we're good with the audience going off script here a little bit was the appropriate amount of time for a COVID positive student athlete to return to competitions. So it sounds like there's kind of a, a range depending on, symptoms and, and other things, but it could be as early as seven to 10 days or as long as 17 days under the, from the British Journal uh, recommendations. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, I, I think, and Chad can certainly, Chad can certainly add to this. I think that the key for me is when are symptoms resolved? I mean, and, and if there were symptoms, have they completely resolved? We have seen, again, when some athletes try to return too quickly, if they're still mildly symptomatic, they actually make their symptoms worse and prolong their recovery to sport. But if, if someone's completely resolved their symptoms um, and, and they weren't significantly sick or symptomatic, if it, their symptoms were mild, we're finding that within seven to 10 days, most of those athletes are back to their baseline and able to compete. Um, and so I think a minimum time of seven days gives you uh, ample time to assess that athlete and make certain that they're ready to return, especially if they've had somewhat of a convalescent period for 10 days or so during an isolation. And I don't know, Chad, uh, your comments on that, but uh, I think that's at least the guidance that I would provide. I think one of the important things to really note is that in these young, you know, healthy, fit individuals, you know, I would say what, what I've been seeing, and, and Jim can chime in on what, what they've seen at Ohio State and with the Big Ten, but there's about 75 to 80 percent of people that will do well. It'll take them seven to 10 to 14 days and they'll be back to be able to get back to sport. But there is a smaller subset of these people that are now being called long haulers where they're really significantly symptomatic with short of breath or other symptoms. And I think it's very important to educate coaches and strength and conditioning folks that some players may not be able to go just because some piece of paper says they're supposed to be able to go at day 10. And so you've got to have some individuality there. And we don't know right now who those people, we can't predict who's going to be a long hauler versus who isn't. And so some of these, most of these kids will be ready to go when the progression is up, but some of them won't. And I think you just have to be patient and ed educated about that piece. Chad, I think your point is, uh, is, is an excellent point. And I would just reiterate that people that are post COVID that are struggling with exercise are not out of shape. They are still struggling with COVID and probably um, need to really be, as Chad mentioned, need to really slow down their activity progression. I think our tendency oftentimes is to push individuals uh, to try to quote unquote, get them back into shape, but that is not the case post COVID. And so we do know um, that if athletes are struggling uh, um, uh, as they return to activity, it is really a sign that we need to stop, slow down and really let them recover. So I would, I would reiterate that if athletes are struggling in their return to activity progression, 
it is that is the time to be cautious, to back off, uh, and to let that athlete continue to recover and slow the progression down. It, it means that they have um, maybe a more significant infection than what they thought, or what uh, even we as healthcare professionals might have thought, given what we were able to see clinically. Okay, great, great information. Um, one other question, going back to close contact before we leave that that topic. The question is. Um, is it likely that an entire basketball team, I would assume from this question, it's not in here, but that, you know, it's a team that's practicing and scrimmaging together and, you know, so they're not separating folks out. Would, a, would the entire team be considered to be in close contact? Well, I, th I think, Jim, it, it, it depends. Uh, it just depends really on who you're talking to. I think there's some public health uh, folks that would say that, yes, they need to be I think the reality is, and I'll let Chad chime in here, is what we've talked about before is um, what is close contact in sport uh, and how much time are they spending even away from athletics and, uh, um, you know, and then what other mitigating factors are there? I think that, um, you know, we've seen a lot of people um, say, you know, oh, we need to quarantine the whole team which is an ultra conservative approach. And what we know about spread within sport, at least at this point is that that may be unnecessary. That being said, if the infection rate in your community is significantly high enough, it may be important to, you know, to be a little more conservative and cautious. And so um, I, I think you have to be very granular when we are making those decisions with your group and not uh, just apply a standard to uh, uh, groups uh, universally. I think the standard, uh, if you, uh, if the, the public health um, standard would be that everybody on the court would need to be quarantined. I think as we're learning in, in a lot more um, higher level institutions or even our institution here, Division Three school, are using uh, some sort of monitoring system where we're getting more and more data about how much how much contact do players have in a practice setting, in a game setting? And so I think we're going to learn more. I, I do agree with Jim that it needs to be sort of individualized. But in my experience so far, the public health professionals have quarantined or recommended quarantine for everybody on the court at this time. When I was in the NBA bubble, that was the strategy that was going to be in place if there was a positive player um, on the team that all those on the court were then going to be quarantined. Okay, thank you. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, you know, in NAI we are not uh, mandating testing, so we don't have any standardized testing across all NAI institutions. So the question is, can teams, given that, can teams travel and play uh, safely over the next four or five months with uh, certainly indications nationwide that the trend for COVID is going in the wrong direction? So I think, Jim, I'll start with a couple things and then let Chad join in here. So as you know, um, I, I want to start by saying this. Testing does not equal prevention. Um, I think there is a mis there's a misconception that if we're testing and testing even frequently, that it prevents the spread of COVID or that it prevents individuals from getting COVID. Testing really just helps us to identify what's going on, what the behaviors of the individuals are, and what the actual you know, prevalence of the infection is in that community. That being said, it can help us to isolate individuals quickly before that spread uh, continues. And so that's really the strategy with testing. There have been a number of um, groups that have gone forward without testing that have had sport. And I think there was some excellent data that came out of the University of Wisconsin that looked at, uh, you know, high school athletes in the state of Wisconsin that participated in a very vigorous um, uh, epidemiological fashion, comparing them to age matched controls. And the risk of um, getting COVID was actually less than athletes that were participating than those that were not participating in sport. And I think it goes back to the point of the real risk is probably away from the sport activity itself. It's when you spend more time in an enclosed environment with a small group of people unmasked and, you know, within close, close distance. I, I will say this. I think the one caveat to this is travel. I think that significant travel poses different risks because we're now changing the populations and the individuals we're exposed to. And we have to really consider that when we're thinking about that, which in my opinion means we have to minimize travel to the extent that we can and to be very um, observant when we are going to travel of all the health measures that we need to take when we're playing sport. Um, 
So I think personally, this is my opinion. This is not based on evidence. And I, Dr. Asman may actually disagree with this and that would be a good thing or, you know, if there's some disagreement, but, but I would say, I think we have put too much emphasis on testing for the return to sport. I think the emphasis should be on education of behavioral modification that will prevent the infection and making certain that we do not lose fact or sight of that fact and making certain that we don't lull ourselves to sleep by thinking that testing is the answer that allows us to play sport. I think if we put the effort into education, into mitigating factors, um, we would be just as successful, if not more successful than we would if we spent considerable resources on testing. I absolutely agree with Jim. I mean, if you look what's going on uh, at, you know, even within the Southeastern Conference and then a lot of the bigger schools who are doing daily testing, I mean, they're still having games canceled and significant number of, of players testing positive. I think that, you know, at the, at the most, testing makes sport safer. I don't know that we can say it makes it safe. I think there's still a risk no matter what the testing status is and would completely agree that if we can get young people to do the hygiene basics, hand washing, wear a mask, avoid large gatherings um, indoors, you know, that's where the transmission is really happening. And so I, I think that you can have success without testing with travel. You know, if I go back into my military experience, it's almost like you need to make travel kind of like a surgical strike where, you know, you kind of keep a clean corridor from your, your small group of athletes onto your bus, you go to your venue, you play your game, you get back on your bus and you go home and there's not a lot of mingling in and amongst other people in, in areas that may have higher uh, prevalences of COVID. You know, you can do things with meals on the road to make them a little safer, order them in, in large quantities, just have them drop them off at the bus, or you can have a box lunch to pick up on the bus on the way to the event. So there's a lot of things you can do that don't involve testing. Um, most of this, the best things you can do for COVID prevention are free so that you can't, you know, even schools with low resources can have people wash hands, socially distance, wear masks, things like that. So I think, again, I think testing give some people a false sense of security. There is some value in testing at times, but I think that sport uh, can be played safely without testing. And Jim, just to, just to quickly mention with the group in Wisconsin, and one of the things just to reiterate that point, one of the strategies that was used that was extremely successful was daily attestation to education, was that athletes every day were being presented with those facts of what mitigated the risk of infection along with having to record their symptoms and their temperature. So they were actually having to, you know, be reminded every single day of those, uh, of those measures. And I think using those strategies really helps, you know, mitigate the risk for this infection. And Jim, maybe building on that a little bit, you know, one of our questions was, um, well, we're not doing mandating testing. We are mandating that our schools screen on a daily basis and report to us that they're doing that. Uh, the question basically says that sometimes seems like screening is almost going through the motions with student athletes, I guess, because they feel like they just sort of know the answers and they give them the same answers each time. Um, how do you, what do you think is the effectiveness of daily screening uh, in general? Well, I, would, I think the, oh, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Chad. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would say that that screening without education, um, you know, especially in, in the young college student population, they may just gloss through it and just click all no, just because they know that they can play if they check no. But I think without the educational piece, daily screening is perhaps futile. But if athletes know why they're having these, these questions asked and why they're important and why they need to answer the, the questionnaire honestly and accurately, I think that really helps the, the screening to be um, more valuable. And certain questions in the screening are more important than others. Um, you know, you've got your symptom screen, but then you also have questions about close contacts. Have you had some of these things that we talk about? Are you, have you had a, a large group activity within the last 48 hours? Have you been unmasked? And, you know, so there are ways to do it that, ex that make it more valuable. And without an educational piece, I agree that it may be, may be a little bit futile. Yeah, and I could not agree with Chad more that if the screening incorporates education, it's very effective. If the screening is nothing more than asking you if you have a fever, if you've been short of breath, had a cough, um, and been around anyone that's been sick, I believe that that is 
you know, really not very effective. But I think unless you are using a screening application that incorporates education and also incorporates attestation that uh, requires someone to actually agree that they'll follow those recommendations, we found that's been very effective in changing culture and gets people to really think about those measures. And that's what it takes uh, to keep, uh, you know, individuals from uh, having risk of getting COVID. Okay, thanks guys. Um, and before we leave testing, you know, there's a lot of good things to think about around testing, but uh, is there, what would be your recommendation of the way to use testing as part of, you know, the, the overall strategy? Uh, for campuses, and then maybe as part of that, um, you know, for a while, PCR tests were considered the gold standard, so to speak, but I know there have been a lot of developments around so-called rapid tests or antigen tests. So can you talk a little bit about if, you, if you're if you able to use testing, how would that be incorporated into an overall plan? Well, I think that, uh, I think testing needs to be incorporated into an overall plan. Um, I think testing in and of itself is, uh, um, you know, is part of an overall plan and needs to be incorporated as such. I think we need to really consider why we're doing testing. Are we doing it to make the diagnosis of COVID? Are we really looking to diagnose someone with the with the infection? Are we looking for surveillance? Are we trying to prevent infections, infectious spread? And I think that the um, misnomer here is that um, we, we have really been interested in trying to make the diagnosis in an individual of COVID where um, our strategies in large populations need to be surveillance of COVID and then putting, you know, mitigating factors into place to prevent the spread. And I think that um, that's why a lot of people have talked about using tests that are less sensitive than PCR, that are rapid, that can give you rapid results that allow people to isolate faster um, and th that make people aware that there could be infection and, and lead to that sort of behavior. So I think testing needs to be incorporated as a larger part of that uh, mitigated risk mitigation uh, process. And I, I, again, I would just reiterate, I think there's been too much emphasis on testing uh, throughout this entire process and not enough emphasis on the other behaviors that need to be followed. And there are, there are different types of tests. I mean, the, the PCR test is still considered the gold standard for diagnosis. You know, antigen tests um, are a little bit different. Uh, I think they continue to get better and better. Um, they're a little bit cheaper than PCR tests. However, the saliva direct methodology um, should cost laboratories about $5 to do. And, and if they add a little markup could be, you know, we're getting the saliva direct PCR here in Minneapolis for uh, $13 per test, getting a PCR level test for $13. And so I do think the cost is going to come down as things get better. But PCR is one, uh, antigen testing is another, and then anti antibody testing is the last. And there's roles for each of these things here. I think as Jim has led the, the Big Ten and, and what they're doing with daily antigen testing, looking kind of more in a surveillance mode to find out what's the infectivity in the, the athletic population. You know, positive antigen would need to be confirmed with a positive PCR generally if you're trying to use that for diagnosis. But I think there's ways to look at your model um, to consider what is the infectivity in your community? What is the infectivity within your athletic department? What's the infectivity within an actual team? And then create strategies there where you're not doing daily individual person testing, but you're getting information about your population that you can then use to to minimize your risk. Okay, thanks for that. Guys, one to follow up to that, we had a question from one of our uh, presidents at a Michigan institution. I think recently Michigan has mandated that if they want to continue with athletics, they would have to test six days a week. And there are some who are saying, well, you know, three days a week is enough. Is there any, any suggestions on how they might want to go back to the state, the folks of the state of Michigan to, to, offer a suggestion on maybe a different way to come at it? So I think, Jim, I can speak a little bit to this. There, there's um, public health epidemiological, you know, modeling that can be done to affect how, to show us how effective testing is and depending on a surveillance mode, which is really what this question gets to is, if you're testing six days a week in a closed population, which means that the population is, um, has no one else entering or exiting that population, um, you effectively can reduce infectiousness to close to 100% because 
we're testing frequently enough that no individual will become infectious to another before we would identify them. Now, the, the, the complication with that is, is that none of us in athletics have a closed population because our athletes are, you know, they're interacting with people outside the athletics population, but we can make certain that as much as we can, that the court of the playing field or the, you know, the area of competition or practice is clean, so to speak. When you drop that to three times a week, the um, percentage drops uh, a little bit inside that closed population, but drops even more when you're interacting with other individuals. And it doesn't mean that that's not effective enough. It, it certainly in a surveillance model can be effective, but if the community you're in has a significantly high um, infection rate or infectivity rate, it may not be enough uh, to prevent uh, infection amongst those groups. So um, again, I would say that whether you test six days a week, seven days a week, three days a week, the real risk mitigating factor will be the behaviors of the individuals inside the testing program. That's really all that testing, in my opinion, is doing in a surveillance mode is just reflecting those behaviors that are mitigating the risk of the virus. I think there was some good information out of uh, the University of Colorado that was used in the PAC-12 uh, plan, which kind of shows based on what your community prevalence is or the infectivity rate, what you could gain with testing based on daily testing every other day, that sort of thing. And so I think that modeling is out there and I'd be happy to share that link with, with you, Jim, um, on the study that they did. Um, I think, you know, what the, the president of Spring Arbor is, uh, is bringing up is that sometimes we have reasonably well thought out evidence-based plans, but states will do what states will do. And sometimes you're kind of, you're at a crossroads of public health versus athletics or sometimes public health versus common sense. And, you know, you're, it, it would be hard if you were an institution in Michigan and the state did say that you need to test six days a week to not test six, six days a week and then be able to support or, or hold that up. And so I do think going at them with uh, some science and some data may be a way to, to get that into a more manageable way. But I do think in a lot of states we're seeing, you know, severe overreaction to what they think might make things safer. Uh, we've been saying all along that, you know, surveillance is important to know what your infectivity rate is. Do you need to do testing six days a week to get to that? Probably not. Um, but I think sometimes it's hard to, to convince public health professionals differently. Yeah, okay. yeah and I would, I, would, I would agree just quickly, Jim, uh, with what Chad said. I think one of the things that's very difficult in this situation is not to make emotional, very quick decisions. And we tend to gravitate towards those things that are... Um, uh, uh, closest to us that we think are at the highest risk. But to be very honest with you, those decisions have not been made uh, using um, really good data behind those decisions. It's made based on the theoretical risk of the certain activity that there is there that's there. But I am, I have to tell you, I'm very encouraged to hear things that the CDC is now saying and other large groups are saying using data-driven approaches to make decisions and not emotional approaches uh, to make decisions based on one small incident or one small group of cluster of cases. Um, I think it's really important that we're measured in those decisions. Okay, yeah, thanks guys for that. And um, kind of shifting gears a little bit on what looks like some questions are coming in, kind of three different, different areas. Um, one around um, kind of mask wearing, and so I have a few questions around that. Uh, another around some of the cardiac issues associated with, with COVID. Uh, so I want to have a few questions around that, but the, maybe start with the third topic, and that is around vaccine and treatments that are becoming available. So I guess maybe just to start on the vaccine front, um, you know, I think everybody's read the reports about Pfizer and others who are making some progress. What, how do you guys think about the potential of a vaccine in this academic year? Let's just start there. Is there any, is it, is it realistic to think that a vaccine will help us as we think about sport through, you know, let's say through May? I think, you know, you, you, uh, you alluded to, there's two or three companies that have, that are close to being ready with their vaccine. You know, they still need to complete some tests, get approval from the FDA. Then they need to, to manufacture large quantities and figure out how to distribute it. Um, I do think that 
you know, the initial plan and vaccine distribution is going to be to target frontline healthcare workers, uh, the most uh, at risk populations. And so getting it down to young, healthy people in departments of athletics, I think they're going to be in the, the bottom tier of people that, that get the vaccine. And so I think, you know, we should be seeing some distribution in America, probably in the February timeframe. Will it get down to, you know, athletes by by the summer? Maybe or maybe not. It depends how much distribution they have out there. The other thing is, is I think with a lot of these things, people are rushing to get things onto the market. And so we've seen that a lot with the testing where the FDA would approve tests based on 30 samples run. The more data you have, the better, you know, we know, understand how the test works, how the vaccine works, things like that. And so the pr protection rate of antibodies post-infection is still debated. I mean, it's still not sure how long, if you've even had a symptomatic COVID infection, how long antibodies would protect you. Likewise, that's the goal of a vaccine is to give you the same protection as you would have had from having the, the disease without having the disease. So I still think there's not that long-term data on the vaccine to know, is the vaccine going to be protective? Right now, I think they're looking at a two-shot series spread over three weeks. That adds to a little bit more of a log logistical thing. But I think the science on the vaccine has come, a, come a, along quickly, and that's exciting. I do think sort of the distribution implementation uh, part is the going to sort of be the next challenge. And I think that ethically, you know, young, healthy college athletes probably should be at the bottom of the line for, for this vaccine. Jim. No, I, I agree with what Chad has said. I, I actually, uh, you know, again, my opinion, I believe that vaccine will be available in the April, May time period, probably for collegiate athletes and, uh, the, the way that it's going to be rolled out. Um, I, I also, um, agree that, uh, there are questions, um, uh, you know, about how long immunity lasts. But I will tell you that I believe that what we are seeing now, apart from antibodies, memory T cells, uh, B cell immunity to COVID and what is being reported, that there is probably longer term immunity and even immunity that may last for years from people that have been infected and decrease the severity of the disease. So I think it's really important for mm -hmm. people to understand that um, uh, there is, there, as people have said, there is light at the end of this tunnel. Um, we have to, you know, we have to be cautious, I think, but I, I am very encouraged by the data that's been put out so far about these vaccines and think they will be a game changer for us as we get into 2021. Okay. Thanks for that, guys. Um, so maybe turn into um, some questions around cardiac issues. And Jim, if I remember correctly, I think the, that was one of the big concerns of the Big Ten and the reasons that they were delaying the start of uh, football in particular, but I think there's fall sports. Um, kind of what's, the, what's the latest on some of those cardiac issues or challenges um, that, that we need to be thinking about or, or know about? Sure. So I think, Jim, uh, in general, we know um, it's just fact that this virus attacks cardiac muscle um, more vigorously than other viruses. Um, it's fact that we've seen more cardiac problems, especially in sick individuals in the hospital from this. Um, what is not fact is um, knowing exactly what the effect of that is on someone who gets COVID, who's a young, healthy athlete that has mild symptoms. Um, we have, uh, you know, published on and looked at athletes uh, with very sophisticated testing, including cardiac MRI at, uh, at the effects on the heart. But we have a lot of difficulty in translating acutely into what that actually means, and it may not mean really much clinically. I will tell you that the concern that many of our colleagues have, colleagues that are experts uh, in things like cardiomyopathy, which is weakening of the heart, or electrophysiology, which is the electrical system or arrhythmias, bad you know, uh, rhythms of the heart, is that we do not know the long-term effects of someone that's had COVID and what that may look like three or four years down the road. And that is not to be an alarmist. It's just to say that just as with concussion 25 years ago, we did not know what the effects were of concussion as we've learned more. 
um, we hope we're going to be smarter as we move forward. And so fortunately, we have not seen, you know, significant cardiac death or, um, you know, uh, illness uh, from myocarditis or other things uh, that uh, are attributed uh, to the, you know, to the heart and uh, college aged athletes. Um, that being said, we need to remain vigilant for those athletes that struggle with exercise and have symptoms uh, such as chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, exercise intolerance to make certain that we're evaluating them appropriately. Um, and I'm very encouraged that there's more and more data coming out that's helping us to understand uh, uh, these effects. So I think it's something we need to be aware of. I've said all along, we shouldn't be an alarmist about it, um, but we also should not bury our heads in the sand and say that um, you know, hey, there isn't any risk here. We actually don't know what the risk is. Um, we'll learn more about the risk, uh, but we just need to be aware of it. Chad? Jim, real quick, I'll follow up to that. So, yeah. so just to make sure we're understanding your, your view on this, Should, would that lead you to um, having any cardiac testing or pulmonary functioning testing be a part of return to play or not necessarily? I think for and I've said this, uh, as you know, I've spoken with governors and other people. This is what I have said, and I'll, I'll, I stay with this opinion. Um, my opinion is, is that if you have someone who's asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and they're monitored at a return to exercise program and they've met with their healthcare provider and they're not struggling to get back to exercise, I don't believe that they need any additional cardiac testing. Um, if they are having, if they've had a more significant illness where it's taken them a longer time to recover, um, or if they're, sh they show signs in their return to exercise, a difficulty, you know, and in exercise intolerance and chest pain, shortness of breath, those sorts of things, then I do think that they need, uh, an appropriate workup. And, uh, I think that workup needs to start with at least an ECG and most likely an echocardiogram. Um, and if there's abnormalities there, then going on to more advanced testing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that algorithm is based on expert opinion. Every algorithm that's been published has been based on expert opinion. Um, and I think that, uh, that's, that's how it should be followed. But the most important thing in all of that to me is the athlete, you know, meeting with their healthcare provider to, and being monitored in their return to exercise to make good decisions. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Chad, anything to add on that? No, but I would just circle it back around. We talked about the return to play progression before, and that's one of the reasons why it is so important. You know, 80% of these kids are going to progress normal and do, do well. 20% are going to have prolonged symptoms. But then you're going to have a really small number that are going to struggle a lot more than others, or they're going to have significant symptoms um, that do need further evaluation. We've helped... Um, health systems and youth sports leagues here in Minnesota and Wisconsin put together protocols where it's, you know, not strictly based on cardiac testing to return to play because we know that the access to a lot of that stuff is not available in, in all places. And so I think you need to be smart about it. And I think, you know, following the symptoms again, and that's where education comes in again as well. I think if coaches, strength and conditioning and, and athletic trainers and even medical personnel kind of aware of, of where, where the athletes normally would struggle and what that would indicate and why we're concerned with that. I think that then helps guide uh, a safer return to play process. Okay, yeah. thanks for that. Uh, switching gears a little bit, um, there are a number of questions coming in around uh, when should student athletes wear masks or I guess people involved in our, in our sports programs and two particular questions were, is it, is it helpful at practice or is it, you know, is it recommended at, at, a, at a practice, say for basketball or hockey in this particular question? And then a similar question around travel, you know, student athletes on a bus or in close quarters together. So Chad, maybe start with you on that one. Hey, my recommendation for masking has been if you're in a situation where you're not um, doing high level or vigorous activity and it, it, and a mask can be reasonably worn, it's a very safe, effective, and cheap way to, to potentially mitigate the spread. And so absolutely on bus trips, you know, I saw there was a, a question in, in the, or a comment in the chat about box lunches on buses. And, you know, you do, again, you know, if you, you obviously have to take your mask off to eat or drink, and so that can lead to something. But if you're spaced out on a bus appropriately um, and you eat quickly and put your mask back on, I, I think that should be fine. But I do think masking where you can, I think if you're doing walkthroughs, wearing a mask makes sense. If you're doing, you know, if you're just shooting warm up, that may make sense to wear a mask. The more 
cost-effective mitigation measures that you can put in place, I think um, the better things will turn out. I think when you get into that vigorous sport, though, and that could be different for different sports or different people, you know, then it sometimes becomes difficult to wear a mask. But I think in, er in, in times when you can wear a mask, you should. Great. Thanks, Jim. Anything to add? Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is uh, I, I completely agree with Chad and the mask needs to be the appropriate type of mask. So I would rather see people wearing the appropriate masking material, not wearing face shields alone, which do nothing, um, not wearing, you know, um, thin gaiters that are not double plied, at least that uh, really don't stop, you know, the transmission of the virus um, and making certain that when they can, they're wearing those. And certainly you mentioned travel, Jim, everybody should be masked when they travel. There's no reason not to wear a mask right now when you travel. And certainly if you're not testing, I agree with Chad, the most, the two most cost effective things that you can do in travel is to be appropriately physically distanced and to wear a mask. And neither of those cost that much. And so I would agree with him completely uh, regarding those recommendations. Okay, good, good suggestions there. Thank you for that. Um, one, yeah. one more thing that I would add, depending on your mode of travel and I mean, where you live in the country, but if you can create some airflow within a bus, if you can open some windows and get at least some airflow throwing the airflow through, there's been plenty of studies to show that if you have better ventilation, the risk, uh, so we know it's an airborne disease. It's, it's caused by people either coughing or you know, expressing virus particles, and they tend to hang around in the air for a period of time when people are in close space, which is why if you're singing or talking, that's how it gets spread. But if you create ventilation or some airflow, then that helps move air through there, move some of the, the virus particles out of the space, which can then make it safer. And so if you are not say in North Dakota, where it may be reasonable to open every other window or a couple windows to create some airflow, ventilation I think would be helpful as well. And that's also free. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Um, here's a question we just got in around, um, I guess to me it strikes a little bit of the idea of, of, a, of a bubble. We obviously, our schools aren't in a position to create a bubble like Chad, you mentioned the NBA previously, but would there be any benefits to housing all student athletes together? We don't typically have athletic dorms in the NAI at our, at our institutions, but um, what do you guys think about the concept of, of housing student athletes together as opposed to among the, the general pop, student population? So Jim, I, I, start with you. Yeah, I can address that, Jim. I think it's actually an excellent idea. Um, we've used that strategy in other places, uh, um, and not just around student athletes, but making certain that when you're rooming with someone, you know, your roommate is somebody you spend a lot of time with, you should spend that time and not be, you know, uh, cross contaminating with, uh, um, you know, with other individuals. Uh, and that would be true if you're in the choir or theater or other places where you're going to spend time with individuals. It's true when you travel, you shouldn't mix roommates. If you have a roommate at home, your roommate on the road, should, if you need to have a roommate, should still be your roommate at home. Um, and the reality is, is um, uh, that it's just um, safer should to, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to do that to make certain that the people that you're around um, are the same people by and large, uh, most of the time. And so we know that the biggest risk for spread in our general communities has been gatherings at people's homes with people that don't live there. And so you know, it just makes sense that if you're going to spend all this time with your teammates, which college athletics is um, at this point, if you're going to go home, you should spend, if you have a roommate or a couple roommates, they should be the same people. And I think to be quite honest with you, that has helped in a lot of situations mitigate the spread of this, not what's going on in athletics, but what's been done outside of the athletic uh, um, environment. And although I know sometimes that's not something that's um, you know, endorsed on college campuses. It is something at this point uh, in this situation that I think is a, uh, uh, an excellent idea if it can be done. I think another thing around that topic is your athletes tend to want to play their sport. They want to practice. They want to do the right things. You're still going to have some that, that don't, but for the most part, I think your athletes are going to want to go you know, all in, if you will, to try to make sure that they're minimizing their risk and putting that 
putting athletes in that sort of environment is relatively safer than if you're in the general population and you have, you know, your roommate is a party animal and is out at all these events all the time. And then bringing that back to your, to your athlete who then introduces that to the team. And so I think some, you know, it's like behaviors that you see within athletics um, can also kind of help with that model as well. Okay. Helpful. Thank you. Um, so just, a few more questions, just kind of not on any particular topic, but they're, um, you know, one that I've heard before and, and certain folks subscribe to is this, this idea that the, the age and the, the relative health of student athletes is, you know, is, is pretty strong. And so therefore the, the, uh, the number of the percentage of cases that are caused hospitalization and death is very, very low in that population. So the question essentially is with, with those facts is all, are all these measures really necessary? Having, uh, having advised, consulted, and taken care of uh, a fair number of really young, healthy, elite professional athletes who have gotten COVID and it's taken them weeks to months to get back to a normal lifestyle, you know, where they can walk to the mailbox without having to stop and take a breath and several months till they can go jog a mile when they're used to, to completing world championship Ironmans. I mean, so I think it, it does have more effect on the young population than people tend to think that 99.9% .9 number makes it seem like it's exceedingly small and it is smaller or the, the disease consequences in young people are typically less than they would be in older people or people with other comorbidities, but, but they're not zero. There, ha there have been college students who have died from COVID. There's been one, uh, basketball player in North Carolina, one football player in Pennsylvania. So it does happen in this population. And then we're seeing some with significant cardiopulmonary limitations. You know, they may not have significant disease on scans or studies, but they're not back to their usual uh, frame of health. And so I, I, I do understand the, the point of the question, but I still think that, you know, there are young people do get affected as well. Yeah, and I think, Jim, the, the other point to make here is that things that we're suggesting that uh, should be must are really things that are pretty straightforward. I mean, wearing a mask when appropriate, physically distancing when you're away from your sport as best you can, avoiding large gatherings and practicing good hygiene. And the reality is, is that not getting sick is always better than getting sick. And especially with this virus, because we just don't know what the long-term consequences are. And we hope obviously, and many have hypothesized that they won't be significant. Um, and we'll certainly learn more about that as we go. But to take some of these um, mitigation uh, measures, um, they are reasonable. Where I will say that I don't disagree with this idea of um, uh, the importance that sport activity plays in the lives of people that are, you know, this age and, and have dedicated a lot of their uh, time and effort to sport is that I think it's a very emotional knee jerk reaction to say we just shouldn't have sport or we should just stop it or we should, you know, not let people exercise because of this risk. I actually think there's a significant amount of mental health and physical health risk uh, to doing that as well. And I think actually we should be charged with having to find a path forward to allow people to, you know, engage in their sport given that it's safe uh, moving forward. So from that standpoint, I agree with it. Whoever has asked that question, um, not that we should ignore the risk of COVID, but that we owe it to our athletes um, to make certain uh, that we're not sacrificing all the other um, health benefits, uh, including mental health benefits from sport um, at the expense of just this one infection. Great, thanks. Uh, one last question that I want to give each of you, maybe 30 seconds or a minute if you had anything we didn't get to cover that you were just some closing comments, but um, you know, so far in the NAI, it seems like most of the competition is, is fairly local or regional. So we, we, I think schools are trying to, at this point, uh, reduce the number of overnight trips, but, you know, obviously in the, in the big 10 or the, you know, the ACC, SEC, they're farther distances. So, um, you know, they're doing some overnight trips and Jim, in particular with the, with the big 10, anything that um, they're learning from that to keep, Keep their students safe when they do have longer trips? Yeah, I think there's a couple things, Jim, just to mention, uh, and Chad mentioned. Number one, it's uh, absolutely imperative that you wear a mask when you travel um, and making certain you're masked. It's the uh, most important thing you can do. Number two is 
absolutely limiting interaction with people that are outside your group. And so uh, we know that the biggest risk factor for people that travel is when they interact with their parents or with their siblings or friends that travel to watch them play or that may be coming to their hotel. So we've encouraged everyone um, to limit any exposure to anyone outside their group when they travel and make the trip as short as possible. Um, And, you know, I think if you do that, um, it, you can be, you know, um, along with some of the things around meals and not congregating to eat meals in, in ways that have been done before, either in smaller groups where you're physically distanced or, you know, uh, sometimes even eating outdoors. But those are probably the biggest things from travel that we've learned so far. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, I think to Dr. Asplund's point, uh, if you can shorten the travel time period, uh, it's uh, it significantly improves your uh um, chances of not getting COVID. All right. Well, thanks for that, Jim. And I, we're, we're bumping up against our time, so maybe we'll leave it at that. But I do want to give um, give each of you a chance, Chad. Maybe start with you. Any just anything else in general that you think is important for the for our members to understand as as, as we keep moving forward? Well, I just want to thank you for putting this on and for in, inviting us to have the opportunity to speak. I think getting out some good information and will help. I think. I think a lot of the the athletic population is lulled into this sense that you have to test in order to play. I think if we're making sure that we're educating, we're mitigating risk where we can, and we're doing the the easy and the cheap stuff, then you'll go a long way to making sports safer. I do agree with the comment that uh, many of the young people won't get sick, but I do think we owe it to athletes to do the things that we can do to make it safer, as safe as we can. And so, Again, I think education is important, and I think that's where one of these pieces fits in. So thank you for allowing us to address your membership, and um, and I look forward to – I hope – I don't – I'm a glass a little half less full than Jim about thinking that there will be a vaccine on college campuses in May, but he goes to, you know, big-time universities, so they'll probably find a way to make it happen. But I think once that happens and we get back into it, I'm hoping that – you know, within 2021, we can get back into more normal sports. But uh, but thanks again for having me. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Thank you for uh, you know, being a part of our our team to try to help keep our student athletes safe and our members members informed. And Jim has been on our team for a while now, and really appreciate all he's doing. Jim, we'll we'll leave we'll let you have the, the final word, so to speak. Any uh, any other uh, comments or things of value for the members? Uh, Jim, again, thank you. And thank you to all the members that joined us today. Uh, it's really our pleasure to, you know, to uh, uh, be able to help support the NAIA and also to, you know, support your member institutions. Uh, I, I just want to leave with this last thought is that sport has always been important uh, to um many different uh, levels of uh, competition, but also many different levels of education. And sport has also helped us to provide a way forward many times and helped educate us uh, in our way forward. Um, And so I think that, um, you know, I I could not agree more with Dr. Asplund. I think that we need to work to find a way forward for athletes to be able to compete. I think there are ways forward to do that. And I would just reemphasize again, I think you asked me this question in May, Jim, and I told you this in May, and I'll tell you again, I would sacrifice all the resources for testing if it meant that we could get better education and better culture around enforcing those risk mitigation efforts uh, to our athletes, because that is what will um, stop the spread of COVID. And so I think that uh, if we focus on that um, and using those testing resources appropriately when we can, uh, I think we can be successful. All right. Well, thanks so much for that, Jim, and thank you for your your time. Um, for those who are still remaining, just one um, quick plug for the USCAH, the United States Council for Athletes Health. Um, go to their website. They've got great resources. Uh, Jim and Chad are, are both uh, part of that great organization. They, um, they're they too humble to, and in this setting, probably didn't want to I put that out there as a plug, but I, I would encourage all of you to go. Lots of things that you can get there for free. They also have other services that they can provide on an individual basis, but please go visit their website and if you, uh, if you think they can help, contact them. But thanks again, Jim and Chad, and uh, we'll probably uh, look forward to getting the band back together at some point in the future. So to speak. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks all right. so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Jim. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.